and uh, let me welcome you in our last panel today on round uh, last roundtable on research for social change. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Professor Teresa Tegener with us, uh, 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 who's a professor of law in the University of Bochum, uh, Professor Gerard Quinn, who was the founder, founder of CDLP, but currently he's a professor at Leeds and also the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in Lund, and Pat Clark, who is currently the vice chair of the European Disability Forum, but previously he was the CEO of uh, Down Syndrome Ireland. I teach uh, disability law at the center. Sorry? Okay, I will speak louder. Thank you. I teach disability law, and it's very fortunate most of my students uh, think of themselves as advocates also. And they work in an area where they think their research matters. Uh, I myself have an advocacy background, and I always struggled when, uh, when I was a PhD student, how, how to combine my advocacy activities and my, my, my passion for social change with my academic work. I had a feeling that not everybody in academia appreciates that. <laughs> Uh, How come? <laughs> so, my question for our distinguished panel would be first to speak about uh, maybe examples of how research can be, uh, how research can contribute to social change, uh, examples of good and bad uh, practices of how research contributes to social change, and how uh, what, what are the conditions, or how can we make research relevant uh, for social advocacy? And maybe we start on the far left with Theresia. Ah, okay. Um, shall I take the mic? Yes. Okay, I think, uh, of course, what comes to my mind first is the background study we did for the CRPD in 2001. And I think you can come in on that later, but I think my feeling was that uh, it was extremely helpful to have that background report um, for the convention. Um, and we only, how did we get that? Um, task to, to do the report. I think I'll leave to Gerard because you are more, were more involved in getting that uh, the, the Office of High Commission on Human Rights commission us with that with writing that report. But what we did is we looked at the then existing human rights treaties, the six treaties, and looked how they were applied or implemented with respect to disabled people. And uh, the six treaties we looked at were the CCPR, I, the Convention on the Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, uh, the Convention Against Torture, the Convention on Children's Rights, CEDO, Women's Convention. And the third was migrants? I don't know. I can't I forget. Anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, but, but we ended up with looking at lots of documents and doing research with civil society organizations and other agents in the field. And uh, we came up with the conclusion that, yes, disabled people are now acknowledged within the United Nations, but the medical model still prevails, and human rights are not, there is no human rights-based uh, approach to disability policy. Um, and, and these, all these instruments are not, uh, if they are implemented with respect to disabled people, uh, it's based on the old medical model, meaning disabled people need rehabilitation and uh, social benefits, and that's it. And maybe to a little extent, e equality rights. And I, I think that was uh, extremely timely that we wrote that report. When we started that report, we did not know that a year later the ad hoc committee would start 
drafting the convention, but while we drafted the convention, I know that that report was extremely helpful in keeping us focused on the human rights track. And I think that was one successful example. And maybe I hand over to um, Jared in terms of how did we get that report? How we did get the, uh, the Office of High Commissioner Commission us with writing that report and what were the conditions that we could do it? <laughs> so, um, do you want me to just continue with that? Okay, because I wanted to also stand back a bit. By the way, great to see some old friends. I won't call them older friends, just old friends. <laughs> and some new friends, like Adriana from Colombia. Viva Colombia, yes. <laughs> um, I'd love to stand back and talk a little bit about the relationship between ideas and change, and more particularly about the role of research and researchers and change, because it's not straightforward. There is not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a very complex relationship, and life is full of accidents. Yeah. It's not really, there's only a limit to which you can intentionally design something to occur. And, and, and so I'll say a little bit about this and maybe then reserve my thoughts for later on when you want me to talk in my own right. Because the whole thing was a complete series of accidents. Uh, Canada had carriage of a resolution before the UN Human Rights Commission as it then was on disability. The resolution was adopted every two years you would need two pricks to hold your eyes open because it was so boring. Uh, they managed to spend four or five pages saying absolutely nothing which diplomats are good at doing, okay? And the Irish Foreign Ministry took courage of that resolution and they asked me, they asked Theresia, they asked Arthur O'Reilly and two or three other people, what can we do to sex this up? What can we do to pour some life into this resolution? And all of us unanimously said it's now time that the international community treat seriously the idea of a treaty. And the foreign ministry were very happy. We drafted the language for the resolution. I, I found it in my files recently. I think I emailed a copy of it to you. And with these resolutions, you go behind closed doors, you share it with your colleagues, other delegations, they rubber stamp it, and then you just present it on the day. If there's any hint that there would be negativity, it's withdrawn immediately. Sweden and the Netherlands, sorry, I was <laughs> not you, the Netherlands, objected to the language and said it's too early yet to tell if the existing system can't be met to work on the basis of disability. And the head of unit in the Irish Foreign Ministry, and this really comes down to personalities, having the right people in the right place at the right time, decided to hell with that. Well, his language is a bit more um, um, politic. <laughs> and they decided what they would do is come back to the Human Rights Commission 2002, the spring of 2002, but this time armed with a study to show that the existing system clearly wasn't working and to make recommendations for change. So they gave money to the Office of the High Commission. It just happened to be the case that Mary Robinson was <laughs> High Commissioner at the time. You can detect an Irish mafia at play here. Um, so the Foreign Minister donated the money to the Office of the High Commission. The Office of the High Commission commissioned the study. Theresa and I were the lead researchers on the study. Um, and we duly came back with the report, uh, clearly showing that the existing system fell short. And even when it was handed disability issues on a plate, it didn't follow through, seldom followed through. So we made very practical recommendations for how they could change that. Um, but then we threw in a chapter on why we need a treaty anyhow. <laughs> and we weren't contracted to do that, right? <laughs> and I thought it was a logical thing to do. And we did it and we give the arguments for why, even if we shift up one or two gears in the existing system, we need to really have a completely different gearbox and transform the system. And we didn't know, at least I didn't know, that that was really controversial yes. within the Office of the High Commission. We were sticking our necks out far too far. 
States were not ready for it and therefore the Office of the High Commission was very hesitant to put it out there. That's why our names are on the front of the study, to give the Office of the High Commission plausible deniability if they got stabbed in the back by powerful states. But within three weeks, what we said was orthodoxy. Everybody agreed. There was no debate. Um, the lesson to me as a researcher is if you're in doubt, just do it. Yeah. Stick your neck out. Nine times out of ten, you will have a transformative effect on the field. Okay, once out of ten, you'll get into trouble, but that's life. <laughs> um, and then uh, we got, we have an expression in English, we got gazumped. Uh, Mexico um, did not go through the normal route of the UN High Commissioner. Commission. Uh, they went through the diplomatic route in the third committee of the General Assembly in New York, stuffed with diplomats who are not subject specialists, who know nothing about disability, much less about human rights. And that too is a complete accident because a very prominent Mexican politician dropped out in the race for the Mexican presidency at an opportune moment. He dedicated all his followers to Vincente Fox. Vincente Fox won the election 2000-2001. And then he gathered together all the great and the good, including this politician who dropped out and said, what can I do to make a splash on the world stage? <laughs> so this politician who dropped out, who happened to have a disability, whose name always escapes me, I can't remember why, um, said, let's put the issue of a treaty back on the agenda. And that's where the resolution came to the General Assembly in New York. Read it carefully. It said an ad hoc committee, mm, scratching your head, that just means anyone who wants to turn up can turn up, right? <coughs> an ad hoc committee will consider proposals for the treaty. It didn't say we'll draft a treaty. That was because the Irish government and the EU um, forced them to accept that language because they expected this initiative to fail in New York so that then they would bring it home to Geneva and start the process all over again. If they succeeded in bringing it to Geneva, we might still be there drafting yes. the treaty. <laughs> so we have a lot to thank the Mexicans for. So that's a long-winded way of saying we generated the research, we had no idea the way events would pan out. But there's a very delicate dance always going on between ideas and research and events. And I think you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit and one that's open to risk taking and that produces the right kind of research at the right kind of moment, although we weren't to know that would be the right kind of moment. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yes. Right, good Lord, how do you follow that? Um, <laughs> that was truly, um, and, and I've learned an awful lot on that, so I think I'm going to bring it back to the basics um, of, why, of what I was um, delegated to do. But if I, if I may first, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm here representing the European Disability Forum, which is an umbrella organisation of persons with disabilities uh, and their families, and it defends the interests of over 80 million European citizens with disabilities. Apparently recent research in the last two months would put that figure close to 100 million, but I haven't got confirmation of that yet, but 100 million is what it. So EDF is the unique platform that brings together representative organisations, and it comprises of the 27 national umbrella organisations of persons with disabilities, but also another 30 disability specific uh, European NGOs like the European Blind Union or my organisation, European Down Syndrome Association. So all of EDF's work is based on having good, solid research available to it uh, for all our policy work. Uh, for all our policy work is um, evidence informed. However, as you know, there's a lack of data available on disability and more so disaggregated data on gender, age and disability. We do not always have as much research data as we need. And this is why we are happy to be part of this their project as it is, it will generate a new pool of researchers in the area and provide the disability movement with new findings and useful data. Unfortunately, we too often see social change driven by factors other than research. 
and examples of where research directly contributed to social change are difficult for us to give. It is also difficult to see the direct linkages between research and example policy change. And as legislative processes at the EU, uh, at least they are very, very long, these processes. So the direct impact of research on the lives of persons with disabilities can be found in improving assistive technologies such as the development of an accessible mobile phone or voice control for people who are tetraplegic. So that's where we are at this point. So, okay. uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering whether you could speak of, based on what you said, Gerald, about the connection between ideas and, and social change, when is research effective mm -hmm. in contributing to social change? Mm -hmm. And I even started to think about what do we mean by social change? Uh, should research contribute to change of laws, change of policies, or, or is it even wider? So uh, those are two questions, I guess. Uh, that's what I would like you to answer. Um, we are going to start with Teresa. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I, I will start by giving an example where things went wrong. <laughs> um, I did a research project back in um, 2003 to 2007 in Germany. It was called um, Selbst Self, which is about, and it was about self defense for disabled women. Um, and how did I get that project? Be I got it because um, I had a great idea. <laughs> and, and I was asked to, to help the government to, do, to give some gender aspect to the new rehabilitation law. The rehabilitation law was enacted in 2002 and, and everyone, by then we had a strong disabled women's movement and everyone demanded, we also want something in rehabilitation law for disabled women. So no one had an idea, what shall that be? So I thought, hmm. I was by then a certified self-defense teacher. I knew that it was badly needed. And I thought, there's all this money in rehabilitation sports. Let's put it into self-defense for disabled women. So I got this law saying that self uh, rehabilitation sports also include self-defense for disabled women. Um, and then I was commissioned with uh, uh, developing that curriculum based on research. Okay, that is now the research project. So what we did, it was, uh, we worked with uh, civil society organization with different disabled women's groups, for, like deaf blind women, deaf women, women uh, with learning disabilities, uh, physical di uh, disabled women, and, and we did c develop a curriculum for self-defense for uh, and, and, and it was participatory and was, I think it was a great experience. And I think we did produce a, a wonderful curriculum, but the, uh, at the end was, it had no effect at all. Why? I did not take into account that rehabilitation sports in Germany is totally monopolized by the German Disability Sports Organization which is completely male dominated. <laughs> and they were from the beginning against the idea of self-defense for disabled women. That, me that meant you need to talk about sexual violence. And, and we know that it also in, uh, in sports, Paralympics, lots of sexual assaults happen and no one talks about it. And so they were extremely afraid. So they stopped. The, the, the curriculum we developed was never, ever put into practice, was never ever, uh, there was not a single course given because that strong organization, and I, I forgot about them. I forgot about that important social agent in the field. And what I should have done is first connect with them and see if they were willing to help the outcome of the research put into practice. So that was an example where research went into, I mean, it was done for, uh, it ended in dead end. Uh, we still use it for other things, but it was, you know, the idea was great, but I think what my lesson was, 
you need before, even though sometimes you don't have the time to think of all the social players in the field. I mean, that was the example we gave when we talked about this background report. I mean, things happen quickly. You have to grab a window of opportunity. It's not that people will ask you, uh, come to Jared Quinn or Theresa Degna or pa Pat Clark and say, hey, you are so wise. Can you inform us what is the next step we will, shall take in disability politics, and that's going to be research-based because we ask you. No, that's not how it's going to happen. It, you need to wait for the window of opportunity, grab it, and then you need to involve and strategically involve all the social players in the field. Otherwise, you will not be successful. So that's my contribution to that question. I don't know if I answered all your questions, but... Sure. Um, I have one partial failure to report, <laughs> and I think the failures are much more interesting than the successes, which is um, how we at least superficially succeeded in transforming the EU structural funds on right. deinstitutionalization of people with disabilities, but we didn't really anticipate all the tricks of the trade yeah. that could be used to slip <laughs> underneath. And I think there's a lot of lessons in that, and I'll, I'll unfold that momentarily for you. Um, but I just wanted the opportunity to stand back even briefly to talk about processes of change and the relationship of ideas, knowledge, data, call it what you will. By the way, recently, a good colleague of ours in Australia, Andrew Burns, yeah. was considering doing the equivalent of our study for the rights of older people to inform the drafting of the Treaty on the Rights of Older People recently asked me naively, what was our methodology? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, shit, I haven't even thought of that question. <laughs> Just bloody well do it. Anyhow, um, which shows the dead hand of social science, I think, and how it can dehydrate good ideas and be very, very careful about not allowing methodology to quench the kind of passion and the ideas that you... Don't get me started. Okay, standing back. I think, you know, much of my family background is in rural Ireland, and I always think of a, a stool for milking the cow with three legs on it. <laughs> and I think change has three legs. It's really about power. Uh, it's about power keepers, gatekeepers, policy makers, and even lurking behind them private interest groups who have a vested interest in the status quo continuing. Then you have voice, civil society, with their own kind of uh, articulate or inarticulate sense of grievance and how that gets translated and mistranslated. And then you have research and ideas and entities like human rights commissions, universities, research bodies. And that's the golden triangle. If you can get that humming well, um, you, you're going to get a good process of change going. And even when your successes are tiny, over time they accumulate, and that's the important thing. And I think the, what you really need to start from, I'm a legal realist, by the way, what you need to start from is that um, governments normally have a very narrow policy narrative. Okay, to us it could be dignity and equality and inclusive equality, um, <laughs> But the government's disability equals costs, equals problems, equals <laughs> unforeseen risks, okay? Very, very narrow, narrow policy narrative that might be some icing on the cake in with human rights, but that's really the DNA of it. Um, there's a statistic, and some British political sociologist came up with this, whereby the average senior policy keeper in government innovates on average over a 30 year working span once in their careers, okay? Maybe twice if you're lucky. So you gotta get that right guy at the right time and influence him with the right ideas. And when it works beautifully, it works really beautifully, but mostly it doesn't. But you should always be thinking, who is it in this room who's gonna be that person? How can we cultivate him and not do anything that isolates him within the system? Systems are risk averse. They're very happy living with the costs of the existing system. Um, maybe it hurts you, but it doesn't impact others. They don't have political power and they don't need to take notice, right? 
So they're quite willing to live with the known costs of the existing system rather than to experiment with something that might give rise to unforeseen problems and costs. They're also really concerned about the spillover effect. Well, now you're going to claim this, but what will this group claim and what will the other group claim? And so on and so forth. And they're very, policymakers in particular, not the politicians, they're very worried that if they innovate, they'll be left in the cold, particularly by their political bosses, who will disavow all knowledge and leave them in the, in the cold, so to speak. Now, there are still opportunities in there for change. Uh, and I think one of the interesting ones is when there's times of political competition, when parties are forced to compete with each other, when they adopt uh, programs that are quite innovative. They may not believe in it, but they're forced to compete with each other, and you have opportunities there. Sometimes when they put forward a logic that's very, very negative, you can use it against them. For example, the European Commission's legal service for a long time maintained that the UN Convention is nice, but is completely irrelevant to most things in EU law, unless there's what's called a live dossier, a piece of legislation going through the institutions. Well, guess what? In 2013, the structure of funds were up for renewal. There was a live dossier. <laughs> so they couldn't get off the hook of their own logic, so to speak. You will sometimes find a policymaker who wants to make a career out of innovation in a certain sphere. So part of the trick is to know, to know that system inside out uh, before you can intelligently decide what the research is, how it should be shaped, and so forth. And I always think, um, as researchers, we're very bad in our research questions. And I think the main reason is we don't understand the policy field. Because first of all, you have to be asking yourself, what's the policy question? What is the obstacle to change? And how can <coughs> research, so to speak, lessen that obstacle or create more incentive for change to occur. Uh, so I always kind of reverse engineer the research question from the policy question. Uh, and that requires that you have insight into the policy sphere. And very often the stated reasons for no change are not the real reasons for no change. And I mean, one of the interesting things that uh, one of our colleagues, Oliver, not Oliver Lewis, Oliver Lewis, yeah. I keep getting mixed up with Anthony Lewis in the New York Times. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver, <laughs> two Oliver, different Oliver people. Oliver um, Lewis. Has this interesting thesis about corruption as an obstacle to change, hopefully not in West European countries, but perhaps in some Central and East European countries, where the real obstacle for change is not the politicians or the policy makers, but the capture of that process by very powerful private interests. You have to be aware of this, OK? And by the way, the fancy term being used nowadays is path dependency, that the policy makers are only used to doing things one way, and furthermore, the private interests are not willing to have things done any other way. Okay? On the voice side, civil society side, there's a temptation always to drill into the complaints, the grievance, and not to see the bigger picture, and not to see how it's connected to the bigger policy picture. And that's wholly natural because that's the way you experience things as an individual or as a group. Uh, I think it would be true on balance to say our American friends have been much better at spotting policy opportunities in the policy apparatus and using them, and in fact much better in circulating people between the policy world and the knowledge world than we have in Europe. And I think that's one of our disadvantages. We need people who really understand where the policy openings are, although they might be very limited, and then run a coach in form through them. We weren't to know that there was a policy opening in the UN level when we produced our study. And the study kind of responded to circumstances, but also created circumstances, which was very, very nice to watch. Um, I think um, Judy Human, I don't know, many of you know Judy Human, always says it's not enough to go into a minister's office banging him or her over the head. We all love to do it. <laughs> uh, but she, she actually says you need to know more than the minister. And you need to go into the minister with policy solutions and suggestions. You need to be able to translate your sense of grievance into blueprints for change. 
and almost, and this is um, dirty language, right, have cost-benefit analysis to at least appease some of the, the bean keepers and the bureaucracies behind the scenes. And we have not been good in Europe in what's called co-production of policy. Um, governments are not convinced that co-production is a sustainable way forward for them, that it has benefits to them. And I think in civil society, we're not yet skilled enough to be able to do that. Um, and what about research? And I'll stop here, because I know I'm boring you to death. Uh, I think um, a lot's probably been said over the last two days about not doing research about people anymore, but doing research with people and optimally giving people themselves research skills to do their own research. I think that's been probably flogged to death, and rightly so. Um, I think the research in this domain <coughs> has been really good in explicating the bleeding obvious. I mean, uh, I was asked recently to do a paper on poverty and disability, and he says, okay, but I'm not going to recount all the prevalence data and statistics. That's just, everybody knows that, so what? Nothing turns on that. By the way, systems, even when facts are presented to systems, they don't necessarily respond logically, okay? Uh, I've heard a lot about evidence-based policy making. I've never seen it. It's usually the other way around. It's policy-based <coughs> evidence making. That, and that's not all bad. That's when sometimes you have a policy entrepreneur within a system who encounters obstacles within the bureaucracy but needs the evidence to push an agenda forward. Um, but the idea is somehow that an exposition of inert data will in and of itself bring about any change, that's just completely wrong-headed. It's very unintelligent research as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've been very, very bad at asking the right kinds of research questions and I think primarily because we don't ask the right kinds of policy questions about where that research should fit in. It might sound uh, unorthodox, but I think you need to be reverse engineering to your research questions from these obstacles to change and then, then as it were, configure the research to help to solve those obstacles, at least over time. Um, what's my failure? Uh, my failure was the structure of funds. We had an opportunity in 2003 to transform the regulations such that no more monies would be spent on institutions, but it's spent on community-based um, living arrangements and so forth. We put positive language into the funds that in future funding could be spent on developing up community base for support. But we never anticipated the lawyers' reactions. Okay, always, I always work from Oliver Wendell Holmes' the bad man theory of law. Right? Think about what a clever lawyer will say in reverse, which is that, okay, the rules allow for the spending of money in the community, but they don't specifically prohibit the spending of money in institutions. And what's more, many institutions are not institutions. And I think it was the Hungarian government who actually said, in any event, moving from 100 beds, they're not talking about persons, 100 beds, to 30 beds is progressive achievement, mm -hmm. right? So really exploitative use <laughs> of the language. And so uh, it, it's really hard because you have to almost anticipate the loopholes alongside the rules. Like Carl Schmidt said, he who controls the exceptions always controls the rules. Mm -hmm. And so it's always, always an ongoing dance. It's never a finished victory, so to speak. Sorry, I'll shut up. I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can relate to a lot of the things and provide concrete examples to what Jared was saying there in relation to meeting up with ministers, etc. And all of that, <laughs> I have plenty of experience in that regard. Um, but as we said earlier, uh, we have the situations faced by persons with disabilities. Uh, we lack a lot of information in this regard uh, and of th on those who are most excluded in our societies women, children. LGBTI people, people with disabilities, um, and refugees and migrants, and people with certain e ethnic minorities, and older persons with disabilities. It is difficult to prove intersectional discrimination on a statistical level. This in turn makes it difficult to provide both inclusive approaches and targeted ones. We know that women and girls with disabilities, for example, face two to five times 
more uh, violence at the home than women without disabilities. However, more information about these alarming situations is not available. The same is true for the enjoyment of sexual and reproductive rights uh, and health as many women with disabilities undergo without, against their knowledge, and or will, forced, um, will be forced to have uh, uh, sterilisation or terminations. We know this ex exists in Europe, but as yet we have no data. And coming back to what Jared was saying, one area where research is badly needed is on the economic benefits of accessibility for society as a whole. When we push for more accessibility, decision makers often block progress with the cost argument. It is clear to most people that there is definitely a social benefit on accessibility, but the economic argument is more difficult. And accessibility is too expensive, or so they say. Um, but I know that in Ireland we got a, an economic research report on edu inclusive education versus mainstream education, and we got one, of, and it proved that there was no difference in cost, but the qualitative benefits for the children was a, was outweighed any possibility. But the, it was like cost the same, send a child to your mainstream school. Uh, or to send a child to a special school at that time. <coughs> so those are examples. Um, <clears throat> so we suspect, however, from anecdotal evidence and some few studies, that accessibility is in fact beneficial and even helps to generate income in the long run. And for example, if trains and train stations were more accessible and comfortable, more passengers will tra travel by them. Or if a hotel becomes accessible, it gains not only more guests with disability, but also their extended families, etc. So, I mean, there are other examples of um, research that we have, that while I was within Down Syndrome Ireland, that we have done was uh, research into medical management guidelines for children uh, with uh, Down Syndrome. And these were the only research-based things in the country, and they have been adopted by many other uh, organisations of persons with disabilities and used all over the world. And also, another bits of research would be, again, not on the the social end of it, but on practical things like genetics, and we are now engaging with another big genetic screening program on obesity in children with Down syndrome, mm. um, funded by the European uh, community. So these are other aspects of uh, other work that is being done outside of the social and legal and political research. So back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Actually, I would like to follow up on that. Uh, the research is badly needed for social change to happen. Uh, why do we not have enough research? What are the obstacles? Uh, that's what I would like to think about, but I will elaborate on, on that a bit. Uh, so this will be a bit longer question, yeah. and after this round, maybe we will open it up to the audience. Uh, so I think most of us in the room would share the assumption that research should contribute to social change, and even earlier, most panelists uh, identified themselves as advocates. Uh, but perhaps that assumption is not shared with everybody in academia. So, as I mentioned, uh, there are those who, 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 who do not like researchers to be advocates. Uh, so, and I think we all can raise examples of, of uh, how, how advocacy in academia is, is shunned. Uh, so academia has, has their own criteria of judging what is good research. And earlier we heard about examples of lived experience with disability, how, how is that missing and how that could be incorporated. So I'm wondering uh, whether you can think about how, uh, first of all, what do you think about whether the goal of research should be social change? And what are the obstacles? How to perhaps incorporate the criteria which are necessary for research to have social impact uh, into academic criteria, so that it's somehow more accepted in the academia. And, and other way of putting that also, if you could talk about uh, cooperation between researchers and academics in a good way from which both can benefit. Uh, so it's not only academics doing their own thing uh, with their own goals and something maybe coming out of that, and uh, research done by NGO social advocacy groups uh, which is then not accepted as legitimate research by academics, but looked down upon as you know as just advocacy. Uh, so I guess it's a convoluted question with more sub questions. 
So I give the floor for Theresia to crack that. Okay. Ah, no, again, try again. That's okay. Yeah. Is it still on? Yeah. Okay, uh, the first question is, shall research be uh, directed towards social change? Yes, I am. I don't think I, I am I, I don't want to put any of my research energy in any other research. I don't see a point in it, but I do not want to prohibit other research. It's just that for me research which does not has the purpose of social transformation, for me it doesn't make sense and I don't want to be involved. So for me I'm a but I it's clear I also this morning I disclosed as coming from the feminist and disability, radical disability movement, so I'm already biased, it's okay? I mean, that's clear. And of course, um, I have encountered a lot of resistance um, and, well, I think, and many, many other researchers have encountered this as well, that people smile at you, well, they smile at me because they say, yeah, that she's an inspirational, inspirational professor, amazing, as a woman and as a mother, and she, oh, what she all does, but it's not really important what she does. It's, my, it's not really research. It's, you're, not, you're not told that into the, into, in, they don't tell that into your face, but the way it is treated, what you produce is, you can tell that's what's happening and that's what, that's your, what you are up to. And, per, and personally, if you want to engage in tr social change research, that's what you have to deal with. And I don't know if it's easier if you are white, non-disabled, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, I, well, I knew it from the beginning, I was up to it, and um, yeah, that's what you have to deal with. Uh, you have to be uh, strong, you have to believe in yourself, because no one will pat you on, I mean, there will be people patting you on the shoulder, but not the people uh, who are in your immediate surroundings. Um, criteria for good social transformation research for me is that it is participatory. I, I really believe in participatory research, but I do also experience more and more how difficult it is. <laughs> I am right now involved in research project where my uh, research institute on disability has to evaluate six centers for independent living which have been set up in my region as an implementation measure of the CRPD. And we do that research participatory. It takes a lot of time. There's a lot of debate about uh, who has a say in what. And you need to have a clear standing. And sometimes, yes, I have to say, yep, I have to speak as a researcher, as, a, as the director of this research project now, and I have to step out of the movement in order to make that decision. And it, that's sometimes not easy, but that's what you have to cope with. Um, um, I think, um, what, what I, what I th especially when it comes to disability studies, as a disabled researcher, I would say uh, what is desperately needed is uh, 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 many allies. I don't think that disabled people alone can do it. I think we are too few, and I also think it's not good if we do our research in silo. We need non-disabled researchers supporting us, and we need to uh, look at other researchers who are in other fields trying to achieve social transformation because that helps me a lot to do, I think, better research. Yeah, um, I think there's a discernible trend over the last 30 years which kind of shows a different vision of the university, of research, and of knowledge, actually, in society. Um, and I don't know if Jerome and Randvig would agree with me, because you're of the same vintage as I am, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, it's become so much more industrialized. 
People are valued for the widgets and products where they're placed, um, not really for the content, and not really in terms of what I call the sticking your neck out um, phenomenon. And that's really worrying because at one level the taxpayer is getting value because you're producing three a year in journal X, Y, and Z. But you're not really getting value because it's not really um, enriching our unpopular understanding or our debates or our policy debates. And in other words, kind of the kind of ripple effect or the impact of the research um, has been demoted as an object of value. And even when impact is valued, as it is under the English system, that process too is industrialized. It's as if it's been become um, antiseptic and dehydrated. And, and that's really bad sign for the future of democracy, because universities have this kind of schizoid existence in that they're apart from society. They're supposed to be independent. But they're also part of society. We have to see ourselves as good civic citizens to give back. And when you think about Thomas Kuhn's theory of paradigms, right? It's not about knowledge. It's not about knowledge. It's about imagination and creativity. And it seems to me that's been squeezed further and further and further out in the university system. And I don't really have an answer for that, except I, maybe in my dark days, I see that as, as clouding everything else. Uh, I also do think there has been a pronounced tendency over the last 30, 40 years for university researchers to stay as university researchers for 40 or 50 years. I mean, how stupid is that? People should be circulating, right? We should be entering into government for periods. We should. There's no good guy, bad guy distinction. There are good people in government as well as outside of government. And if you really want to understand change, you have to understand the parameters within which other powerful actors work. And you should be entering into civil society organizations and being part of them. Um, there's less circulation now than there used to be in the past. The Americans used to be very good at this. Um, Bob Berndorf wrote the draft of the Americans with Disabilities Act in his spare time, and then civil society groups championed it in the mid-1980s. We hardly ever see that anymore. Is Lisa here, Lisa Waddington? No, she is. There's so few Lisas now in Europe. It's, we need, I'm not going to say clone Lisa, but we need more people like that. So that's a long-winded answer. Sorry. Okay, um, right from, uh, from EDF's perspective, uh, I would like to stress the importance of involving people with disabilities and their representative organisations in research. So we invite researchers in this project to contact, contact us or our members to ensure research findings will have its desired social impact and hopefully contribute to positive change in the lives of persons with disabilities. This DARE project and its predecessor, the DREAM project, were therefore very good examples when researchers also get practical experience of working in the field and the research becomes more targeted and useful from a policy perspective. A good example is one of our DREAM researchers wrote his thesis on the Accessibility Act and he was invited as an ex expert on the file of the European Economic and Social Committee. There was also a strong link between research and advocacy and EDF used his findings and his work also in our campaign for the European Accessibility Act which was sorted out very recently. A less good example at the moment is our research uh, is at the moment is the research done on accessibility in the built environment. There is no common network or body that would unite all the researchers. Uh, so often their researcher research goes unnoticed by advocacy organizations which is a pity. And there are very few academics that approach us actively and a more comprehensive, co coherent framework for cooperation is lacking. So, thank you very much. Uh, and now, we, I would like to open it up to the audience. Are there any questions to our